good afternoon. I'm Jim Moltz, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, Durand's Library uh, 100th uh, anniversary celebrations. Uh, this is our second series of speakers, and we're very pleased to have Mr. Sendak with us today. Introducing our speaker today is Ann Mandel. Ann has uh, served as president of the library, as has her husband Steve. Um, they are jointly co-chairing our centennial observance. Um, Anne has played uh, a multifaceted and important role for this library. She hired our director, Louise Berry. Uh, she's been instrumental, along with Steve, in the, the Capitol Drive, which expanded the library and helped to automate our facilities. She's been a wonderful patron of the library. We're happy to have her with us today. She and Steve are both also honorary trustees. Anne? my privilege and treat today to welcome Mr. Maurice Sendak to Darien and to the Darien Library. We have with us uh, as well his friend Arthur Yorinks uh, and his wife, who is a, um, Mr. Yorinks is a fellow director of the Night Kitchen, the National Children's Theater, with Mr. Uh, Sendak and himself the author of many well-known children's books, many copies of which we share with you at the library daily. Uh, and today we share talent in abundance. Mr. Sendak has come to us today because it is, as Jim has said, our library's centennial year, 100 years. And to that effect, we are writing a history uh, of the library, or rather, a Darien writer, Betsy Stilwell Peterson, who is here today, uh, is researching and writing it. Um, in reading over records of our beginnings, it's clear that the people involved with the creation of this library ever since the beginning have wanted the very best for this library. When Steve, and my husband, and I discussed plans with the Centennial Committee, uh, we wanted to carry the tradition uh, on of the very best. This has been our hallmark, and we wanted to keep up to the mark uh, with a lecture series at the very highest possible level. Enter Mr. Sendak the leading visionary in children's literature today and for more than 40 years, and one of the most highly acclaimed authors and illustrators, with more than 80 books, with uh, 7 million copies, probably more, worldwide, and available in more than a dozen languages. But more than this, we wanted him because we know that his art helps children and former children live their lives and because his work is treasured here at the Darien Library. As a writer, a, a writer in the New York Times said, quote, Mr. Sendak's work has brought a new dimension to the American children's book and has helped change how people visualize childhood. As Mr. Sendak has been quoted, quote, kids aren't afraid of the truth. They need to know. The need to know is an essential part of growing up they need to know what they are going to be con confronted with in the real world. And fantasy gives them the courage to have courage. Mr. Sendak has not always been treated well by libraries. In fact, he has even been banned, and maybe even worse, expurgated in a fashion. One of his leading characters, a little boy named Mickey from The Night Kitchen, his book, The Night Kitchen, um, has had diapers added by some librarians. <laughs> I can report, Mr. Sendak, that Mickey appears in the altogether in the Darien Library. No censorship here. Incidentally, uh, he might have been in good company because from reading over notes of our early history uh, in preparation for the centennial volume, uh, I learned that a copy of the once famous Bre Breaches or Breaches Bible uh, an extremely rare edition in which Adam was depicted wearing trousers <laughs> to avoid offending Victorian sensibilities uh, was given to the library. However, we gave it to the Rare Books Library at Yale. Uh, but not only do we love Mickey just as he is here in the Darien Library, we love all of Mr. Sendak's work and we have for over 40 years. 
beginning with his illustrations for A Hole is to Dig by Ruth Krauss, and including Dear Millie in the Night Kitchen, Higgledy Piggledy Pop, I Saw Esau, his Caldecott winner, Where the Wild Things Are, all the way up to his new book, We Are All in the Dumps with Guy and Jack and Guy. They have all been borrowed, looked at, read, quietly, read aloud, admired, puzzled over, and above all, laughed at for four generations now. Our parents with us, our children, and now our children's children. I can quote Mr. Senback, if I can quote him accurately. He has said, Ray, the generations. So I'm like Methuselah. It's great. They all think I'm dead, and they're so happily surprised when I'm not. <laughs> He's also been quoted as saying that the best antidote to the anxieties and disasters of life is laughter. And this children seems to know and understand from the day he is born, end of quote. In addition to the prodigious number of books written and illustrated by Mr. Sendak, he has also designed sets and collaborated on the direction of theater productions, including Mozart's The Magic Flute, and Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker Ballet, and done animated uh, specials based on his books, and written TVs and lyric, uh, and written, excuse me, book and lyric for Ro uh, Really Rosie, a musical. An important and recent direction for Mr. Sendak is the founding of The Night Kitchen, a theater devoted to the development of quality performing art productions for children. The Night Kitchen has already commissioned some of America's greatest artists to create original works for children as exciting and professionally produced as for adults, as adults expect for themselves. A recent original <coughs> production is So Sue Me by Arthur Urinks, which premiered at the Kennedy Center in Washington. And all this is from a man who doesn't believe in children's books, or rather, doesn't believe in condescending to children, but rather reaching them at the highest possible level. It's been said in Mr. Sendak's work, the child always wins. Today we all win, children and former children. Our neighbor from Ridgefield, Mr. Sendak. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'm a I am a very nervous speaker, so be patient for a while. In fact, I was watching on Channel 13 last night a documentary on Hitler, and they had an old film of his very first speech in February 1933. And the guy announcing the show said, now look how adroit and cunning he is in addressing the audience. And I sort of moved in and watched. I thought, my God, I'm trying to learn from Hitler how to speak to the Darien Library. <laughs> very strange. <laughs> he was very good. Uh, <laughs> um, it's very flattering, lovely to be here to celebrate your 100th anniversary. And I have a tiny anecdote before I get to my proper little notes here, that I too am celebrating an anniversary that has to do with Darien, which none of you know about. I don't think I've told the story, which as of June this coming will be the 50th anniversary of this particular event. And what the event was, it was on June 17th, 1944. I know that because I scrabbled to find a piece of paper this morning that had all this down. Uh, I was 16 years old and my sister was going to celebrate my birthday by taking me uptown, we live in Brooklyn, to see a show and to eat out. Doesn't sound like much, but it was a lot. Um, best of all, we would not be coming back to Brooklyn that night. We would be sleeping over in Connecticut. Now, this was extraordinary. I'd never slept over anywhere. Um, my brother was then in the Army. Uh, he was then missing in action. We were very nervous. He, came out all right in the end, and he was engaged to a young lady in Norwalk, Connecticut. So the event was we'd go out town, into New York, eat in a restaurant, go to the show, then take the train and go to Connecticut and stay overnight in Norwalk. I 
can't tell you the build-up. I remember the build-up. <laughs> the show was One Touch of Venus with Mary Martin. Okay, so we went uptown to New York. We ate in a place called the Hotel Piccadilly. Um, I have, it's true, Arthur. I have the menu card. I copied it out. Um, we ate in a restaurant. There was a band. They were playing. In fact, I'm going to read you the little program. I, I stole the menu. And it says, the Hotel Piccadilly presents in the Georgian room, Bo Perrin String Ensemble playing nightly for dinner. Bo Perrin, string ensemble, would like to play the song you would like best to hear. Please use this card for your request. Fill in and hand to the waiter. And I filled in on my card, Deep Purple. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember Deep Purple, it's a very popular song, and it was in honor of my brother who played the accordion, and the only thing my brother could play on the accordion was Deep Purple. <laughs> So I wrote Deep Purple on the card. Then, having stolen the card, having had this incredible Hotel Piccadilly dinner, we then went to see the show, and then we went to Grand Central Station, got on the train to Norwalk. And we're sitting there, and my sister, and I'm with my sister and her best friend. Uh, my sister pokes me, and right across the aisle is Mary Martin <laughs> with her husband. And my sister urges me, in only the way older sisters embarrass <laughs> younger brothers, to go over and get an autograph. Uh, I couldn't move. I was dumbfounded. She was sitting right over there. And my sister said, draw her picture, and then she'll autograph it. So I did. Did a profile of Mary Martin. Um, she's wearing a black straw hat with a black ribbon tied around her neck with a veil. And I went across the aisle, and I handed it to her rather roughly, <laughs> and she said something very charming, and she signed it. And she asked me where I came from, and I mumbled Brooklyn, and she said she came from Darien. I'd never heard of Darien. She might as well have said the moon. I mean, it was so extravagant that Mary Martin is telling me where she lived. <laughs> um, and so then I went back to my place on the train. Too much, too much, all of this was too much. And she said, and she got off the train, she had this, I think, Texas accent. She said, now you remember, you pay a visit. You hear me? You pay a visit. And there indeed said Darian. And it was over. OK. It was over until, and I copied this, down, at a benefit in May 9th, 1975, where I met Mary Martin. We were trying to raise money for some foundation. And I, I was then the 16-year-old boy all over again. I shoved this silly Hotel Piccadilly drawing at her and said, you can't possibly remember this. And she grabbed it and she said, sure, I remember. You never even paid a visit. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote on it this, which is very lovely. She wrote, uh, dear Maurice, the circle of our life. Again, we meet. Such happiness to find you. So that was 50 years ago. And that anecdote only belongs to this town. Um, when I turned 50, which was 15 years ago, I decided to change my profession. I figured that I had had enough, or there must be more to life than publishing, living in splendid isolation in Richfield, Connecticut, and postponed gratification. Because when you do a book, you could hear a pin drop. Um, Actually, I was wrong about all of that, but that comes later. At this momentous moment in my life, because 50 is tough for American males, um, somebody called up a very, very important stage designer named Frank Quasaro in New York, who had knew my books, wondered if I'd be interested in designing an opera with him. Out of the blue, without any knowledge, training of any kind, I told him I knew the opera, I loved the magic flute, uh, but I didn't know how to design. He said, fine. He was looking for a talented but more or less ignorant designer whom he could control. Um, so thus the new, the new, it began. Now, this made perfect sense because music was and is my first passion. I have no musical talent whatsoever, alas. I do whistle on pitch. And from memory, most of the repertory of Mozart, Schubert, and Haydn symphonies Strangely, no one ever asked me to perform. Um, 
I do perform all the time to my German shepherd who seems not to mind. Um, so short of that, I then did the next best thing, which was designing sets and costumes with Frank for over a dozen operas and various other productions. Uh, I designed these works for somewhat over a decade. Um, and I fell head over heels in love with theater and immediate gratification because people either applaud or boo very quickly. And it was a very short step from there to wanting to begin a children's theater of my own. And with the help of Arthur, whom you've been introduced to, my colleague and best friend, and actually Adrian, my colleague and other best friend, who's another partner, we did found the Night Kitchen, which is a not-for-profit national children's theater. And it has made us very happy and very miserable all this time <laughs> that we've done it. We had a vision, and the vision was to establish uh, a responsible theater that primarily entertained, that didn't condescend uh, or preach or patronize to children. A theater that told the truth to children and to grown-ups. The kind of truth Arthur and I have been trying to talk about. Our version of the truth, if you will, in the books we've written and I have illustrated over these long years. Now this was hard. It is hard. Trying to raise money is difficult. It's like wrestling money out of people's back pocket, it seems sometimes. Putting on productions is costly and difficult, if fun. Um, worst of all, actually, is dealing with, to my mind, a mystifying indifference to children on the parts of people that you would have thought would have invested their whole lives in children. I speak of people in the arts largely. Uh, I shouldn't have been surprised because being a children's book writer, we learn very quickly that we are in the land of publishing Low Man on the Totem Pole. I mean, kitty books are way down there. I remember in the early days of publishing when it was a cottage industry, children's books were a very small business. We couldn't even meet the grown-up people. I mean, we could be on the third floor at Harper's and the grown-ups on the seventh floor, and you never, ever met them. Uh, you're often referred to, I am often referred to as kitty lit author. Very humbling. <laughs> very humbling to be reduced to the elements in a cat box. Um, it was that indifference to children on a very, very serious, basic level that released my fury and made me and Arthur very stubborn to continue on this path and establish. Of course, there is marvelous children's theater in America, but there isn't enough of this kind of children's theater in America. We settled so little. Just look at movies and television. This struggle to keep it going, keep it alive, sort of brought me rather late in life to a fresh awareness of social issues and political issues and put me out there, the Willie Loman of children's theater as how I felt myself to be. Uh, when we ran out of money, which happens, both Arthur and I go back to doing books for children. In that sense, we're very lucky. And right now, we are collaborating for the first time on a picture book. We've never worked together on a, on a book. And we are doing Arthur's hilarious book called The Miami Giant, which I am now employed in illustrating. And the great fun of the two of us working together. Um, it was another previous hiatus that brought me to do a book called We Are All in the Dumps with Jack and Guy. Um, that was a couple of years ago. These were two nursery rhymes from Mother Goose. They're rather obscure nursery rhymes, and they have nothing to do with each other. And for those of you who don't know the nursery rhymes, um, the first one goes, we are all in the dumps for diamonds or trumps. The kittens are gone to St. Paul's. The baby is bit, the moon's in a fit, and the houses are built without walls. The second verse, having nothing to do with the first, is Jack and Guy went out in the rye and they found a little boy with one black eye. Come, says Jack, let's knock him on the head. No, says Guy, let's buy him some bread. You buy one loaf and I'll buy two and we'll bring him up as other folk do. Now, I love these two.
verses. We don't know what they mean. The Mother Goose rhymes probably had a political or social meaning back 200, 300 years ago. The meaning is gone. So they are almost haiku verses. When they become meaningless, we give them to the children. And so they become nursery rhymes. We assume kids don't mind these haikuish things because they make up their own sense to it, and they do. So I found these two verses, whatever meanings they had, as I say, were gone. So I was going to make up my own meaning. And I tried to, my first attempt to fuse these two, because I insisted that they belong together in the sort of stubborn, asinine way of mine, that I was going to make one book of them. So I did. In 1965, I put them together, actually. And uh, it was a dim, sort of fuzzy-headed 60s type flower book, uh, which happily my editor said was awful. Um, and I listened to everything she said. And I put it aside. I somehow never forgot we are all in the dumps. The solution to dumps, so to speak, came in the early 90s in the city of Los Angeles, where I was designing a Mozart opera, and we spent long hours into the night rehearsing. And we were driving. Of course, you can only drive in Los Angeles. And we were driving from the opera house back to the hotel, past Rodeo Drive, which most of you know is this incredibly posh, insane street. And it was past midnight, and in front of these posh, insane stores was a dilapidated cardboard box with somebody's naked feet sticking out, um, sleeping. And the juxtaposition of Rodeo Drive and kids' dirty feet sticking out of a cardboard box, that was amazing. So it came to me, dumps is now. Dumps is what's happening to the world. Um, they fused together. I saw the whole thing. It was really like a movie. But Jack and Guy would be sort of like two characters out of Charles Dickens. And, uh, or they would be James Cagney and Spencer Tracy, small version, uh, living under the Brooklyn Bridge and making out as best they can in a city that has lost all interest in them. But they're interested in themselves and in their own survival. Now, into that inspiration, I mixed my own ambition, ambition, excitement, and hopes for my night kitchen theater. I also mixed a lot of despair over the death of mentors, old friends, older generation that had literally brought me up and taught me how to be an artist, and they were gone. Um, even worse were the deaths of young friends, students, colleagues to aides, and it just seemed like the plague was hitting the world. Um, many of those friends are commemorated in dumps. Into that book also went my gratitude at surviving into my 60s, which is a no small thing. Reasonably intact, still working, only half demented, I hope. Um, mostly what, into that, what went into that book was my fury at the terrible plight of children all over the world. And the realization that came from doing that book that I was now, amazingly, the new old generation. That I was going to take the place of those people who had mentored me. And now I could play papa and play mentor to a new generation of artists. Arthur and I would have established a theater, which could be a repertory company, which could be a school, where young writers, designers, playwrights, what you will, would come and work for us and we were sort of a little oasis of a place. Um, that's what cheered me up. I am going to end this little talk with an anecdote that seems, at least to me, to answer the question. Um, is it right to tell children hard truths? Uh, I've been accused all my career of, of yapping too much and of telling children inappropriate things. I have a feeling I probably inherited that from my father. Uh, my father was a tailor. He would have been amazed to have been considered a storyteller or an artist, but he was. And he used to tell stories every night to put me and my brother and my sister to sleep. It never worked. I'm an insomniac because he scared us so much we stayed up all night. <laughs> also waiting for the next night to hear the rest of the story. 
Now, I know these are very inappropriate stories because I would repeat them in all eagerness in school the next day. The teacher would send me home to have my mouth washed out. I couldn't understand why she was not happy with my father's stories. They were great. Well, I have inherited that problem, it seems. Um, but I also have 40 years worth of letters going back from children who have convinced me that I'm on the right track. Not always. Kids are very blunt. You know, they're very much more to the point than the New York Times ever is in criticizing your book. It's either, uh, I loved your book, will you marry me, yours truly, or I hate your book, hope you die soon, cordially. Um, <laughs> it is to the point. Now for this anecdote, which has to do with the fact that Arthur and I are collaborating on a version of Peter Pan, it's a big, big, big project which will take a year or two to do. In order to obtain the rights to Peter Pan, you have to get them from a hospital in London. Um, J.M. Barry, who of course wrote the play, left the copyright to the hospital at Great Ormond Street, which is a children's hospital. Um, it's a very wise thing for him to do because not Anytime anybody does Peter Pan, they have to go to the hospital and give them big bucks, which is apparently what Spielberg had to do when he did his horrible movie. Um, <laughs> hook, that is. Uh, when I went to London, I had to be in England, some publishing business, so I made an appointment with the people at the head of the great Ormond Street Hospital to see if I could make a deal with them since we had no money to buy the copyright. And they were very cordial, and they invited me to the hospital. This is a huge, huge Victorian hospital. It's like a little township. And it goes back to the 1840s and 50s, and there are four photographs of George Eliot and Charles Dickens and Trollope and Hardy and all the great artists of the day who had been to the hospital and contributed money and talking to raise money for the children. It is now mostly a hospital for terminally ill children. So it's a hard place to go to. Uh, the doctors and nurses were marvelous people, and they escorted me to various floors of the hospital and children in various conditions. Um, they were amazing me because with what I think children know, they were telling me that children know even more than I think they know because they were emphatic in the fact that children who are dying know they are, and that they absorb this not in a... Walt Disney kind of a way, but in a real factual way that astonishes them. But they said the children help the nurses and doctors bring their parents to a knowledge of what is happening. Uh, there are various rooms and cubicles and such, and we wandered about, and then somebody came to report that there was a little girl who knew I was in the hospital, her favorite book was Where the Wild Things Are, and would I come and would I autograph her book? And I was really nervous about this, cowardly, um, but I went. And I was very relieved when I walked into the room because it was a nine-year-old girl with bangs and eyeglasses looking very healthy and strong. And the only thing that told me was anything wrong, she was wearing a hospital gown. And as soon as I walked in, she turned her face away. This is typical how children react because actually this is what her mother wanted. <laughs> children never care about things like autographs and famous people. <laughs> Um, I've learned this over and over again. It's an amazing thing to them after they've been taught all their short lives not to write in their own books and a perfect stranger <laughs> writes in their own books. Or you have to wait online for hours while your bladder is bursting to meet someone you do not want to meet. Um, and so she looked very indifferent and her mother came rushing over to me and thanked me profusely for coming and brought me over to the girl and said, Darling, this is the man who wrote your favorite book, and I can see her freeze. Um, and he wants to draw his, wants to write his name. Isn't that grand? And she just looked totally impassive, away from me towards the wall. And of course, the mother was deeply embarrassed. Mothers always are embarrassed. They never know this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. I've been in many years of therapy. I am armed for this kind of thing. Um, and so I said, um, do you like the book? And she said, no. Um, she said, I used to like the book, but it's a very silly book for an older child. I said, okay. Um, I said, would you like me to write my name? And she said, I, I don't care what you do. 
um, the book was lying on the bed, however, and there was a pen, and the mother was almost in tears at this point. She was humiliated by her child's reaction. So I had to calm the mother down. And then I sat in the middle of the bed, and so I'm in the middle of the bed, and the little girl's on this side of me, and the mother's over there. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'd like to write my name. And she shrugged, like, okay, that's what you like, that's what you like. <laughs> and so I said, you know, what I really would like to do is draw a picture. And she gave me this odd look, like, why does he insist on staying in my room, <laughs> carrying on this way? And so I started to draw. I knew it would catch her, of course. I started to draw the picture. And she said, after a few seconds, she said, did you really illustrate this book? Um, she said, that's a very bad picture. She said, nose isn't big enough. So I made the nose bigger, and the teeth weren't pointy enough. And of course, by this time, she was laughing. And she had moved on the other side of me, and she had grabbed my hand and was appropriating the pencil, and, was, and so she was having a good time. And I was having a good time. We were writing and drawing all over the page, and now she's laughing and giggling, and all the fake sophistication is gone, and she's a kid, and she has now one arm on my shoulder, and she's leaning into me, and she's practically in my lap. So she's here now, and we're both laughing, so I could look over her head to the mother, who's seated at the end of the, and I cannot describe the mother's expression. I mean, it was a combination of, I don't know what, I think pleasure and total dismay that this child who looks so natural and happy and normal is in fact terminal and will not live very long. And on the mother's face is this mingling of feelings so that, in other words, I couldn't bear to look at the mother. So I looked back at the child, lost myself in the pleasure of drawing, and she's laughing, and this actually happened. And while she's laughing and playing, her other arm is free. She has not looked back at her mother. I can guarantee that. But the arm began to move across the bed very, very, very slowly and reached up to her mother's arm and then moved with great poise to her mother's hand and then clenched and shook her mother's hand. She knew absolutely what her mother was feeling and going through. I knew she knew. She had to know. I mean, children simply have to know what's happening in order to survive in this insane world that we live in. So I am going to take this occasion, this nice anniversary time here in Darien, uh, and I know Arthur will go along with me to rededicate our night kitchen theater on this day to the little great Ormond Street girl. Thank you.